What? What the... Oh, come on! There is a war going on. A war for apps. A war between the people that make the apps you use every day, like Spotify, Netflix, and Virtual Single Dead Simulator. And those who build the devices where you use the apps from. In particular, those named after a fruit. Giants like Netflix, Spotify, and YouTube are already ditching the new Apple Vision Pro by just not making any apps for it. And this is not only important because this world today has billions of dollars at stake, but because it might completely change how we use technology for the next 15 years. And most importantly, this is not the first time this exact war happened. And the last time it happened, what came as a result is the internet we know today. I'm Enrico, and on this channel I go behind the scenes of the design, psychology, and future of the tech you use every day. But before looking at the future, we first need to understand how we got into this mess. Because believe it or not, our concept of apps was born just by accident. This is the app of the Oxford Dictionary for your phone. And no, this is the right image. This is the app. It's how you would buy the app in 2005, in a physical box. And I'm not sure why you can still find this on Amazon for some reason. Before modern smartphones, there was no such things as app stores, where you can just install anything. And the first iPhone, no apps. You can have fun with clock. Because Steve built that first iPhone thinking that the future would be mobile web apps that you use from the internet, from your browser. That's it. We've got an innovative new way to create applications for mobile devices. And so you can write amazing Web 2.0 and Ajax apps that look exactly and behave exactly like apps on the iPhone. But in that first year, people started to hack the iPhone and installed their own stores like Cydia, which I might or might not have had on my old iPod Touch back then. And once the iPhone was hacked, people also started to build the first iPhone apps, all without Apple's approval, like the unofficial Twitter app Twinkle. Developers were so excited to build for this new shiny thing. It was so cool and Apple quickly took notice. And in 2008, they launched the App Store and gave developers the ability to build iPhone apps. Excellent! It was never this easy to build and launch something, and people quickly figured out that they can make money from this. So masterpieces like iBeer and iFart and so many others came along. And Apple was taking 30% of all App Store sales, but developers were okay with it. It's a cool new thing, and without the iPhone, they wouldn't have been able to sell iBeer anywhere else. Apps were what made the iPhone a success. This was a time where Apple ads were saying, there's an app for that. There's an app for that. Without developers building apps, the Apple wouldn't be the most successful and money-making single product in history. So everyone here was winning. But as smartphones exploded, this wild ride took a very different turn. Apps are now a gigantic market. They are a part of our lives. The novelty has faded away, and they are not something you buy for 99 cents to play around with. They are huge companies employing thousands of people. They are the largest games in the world. They are a way to access huge global services like Spotify or Netflix. But still, 17 years later, Apple still demands that 30%. And this is the infamous Apple tax. Because the problem is not that you have to give them 30% on paid apps. No, this is on everything. If you sign up to Spotify from an iPhone, Apple will take 30% of that subscription forever. They don't have to do anything with a Spotify service. They don't provide the music or any of that. But just because you signed up from an iPhone instead of your computer, Apple gets 30% of it. And you cannot hack the system by sending people to sign up on the web because Apple would not approve your app if you do it. And Netflix, for example, had to go back and forth countless times for just changing small pieces of text in the login screen. This is not anymore about the 99 cents for iBeer. This is billions of dollars every year. And Epic Games, the makers of Fortnite, who need to give Apple 30% of any sale made on the iPhone, famously started a big lawsuit. But so far, nothing has really changed. Well, almost. Because most people don't realize this, but on Android, it's the same. For any purchase on the Play Store, you also need to give Google 30%. Don't like Google's Play Store? You can install from the Amazon Store or the Samsung Store, and you are not forced to give your subscription revenue to Google if you don't want to use their subscription system. The iPhone started as a gadget. A cool and revolutionary one, sure, but still a gadget. But now, this is more similar to a computer than a gadget. And if this is a computer, many people, myself included, believe that there should be a right to compute. A right to use this however I like, just like I can with my laptop. Because the EU has said, uh, you know what? This is a computer, bro. You have to let people install stuff from outside the App Store. So Apple and their Sigma Grindset team of lawyers came up with the most ridiculous system to make this compliance. Get ready. 
Developers can create alternative app stores, but they need to get certified by Apple and they need to give Apple 50 cents for every install on the app store. Then you can list your app on other app stores, but for a user to install it, they need to uninstall the version that they had downloaded from Apple's app store and install the other one from your app store. Now, apps from other app stores don't have any fees before 1 million users. After 1 million users, Apple will charge 50 cents per install, even for free apps. Also, any in-app purchase or subscription now has a fee of 70% for every purchase or conversion that happens in 7 days from coming from an Apple device. Now, this is lower than the old 30%, but for example, Spotify, which clearly has more than 1 million users in the EU, will have to pay millions to Apple regardless because of this 50 cents even for free users. So, in the end, the CEO didn't act, said, hey, it's not even worth it. And if you are a small developer, sure, no cost, but if your app gets traction and gets over 1 million installs, even if you don't make a single cent from it, you have to pay massive sums to Apple. <sighs> so, in reality, nothing changes. And more and more developers are revolting against Apple. And while in the beginning the iPhone was the carrot that helped them build apps, now Apple is using the stick. The threat of, okay, if you don't want to give us 30% of everything, then we would just not accept your app on the store. Because Apple has famously built its walled garden, its ecosystem of devices where everything just works so beautifully. But to do this, everything must be hyper-controlled. And everyone is complaining that Apple's closed ecosystem is bad, and walled gardens are evil, and everything should be open. But as it turns out, walled gardens are actually a good thing. In tech, there's always this trade-off between freedom to do whatever you want and seamlessness, having something that just works and it's easy to use. And the iPhone is here. It's its own little world where everything works, but you have no freedom. Want to install your own apps? Nope. Want to change the number of columns in your home screen? Nope. Set a song that you like as a ringtone? Nope. But what most people forget is that the other side. The complete freedom is also not good. This is the guy that comes to you and tells you, Oh man, you're using a Mac? Man, you need to switch to Linux Debian v12.4 beta 4 release 32 so you're free from the chains of the big companies. And look, in just 10 minutes with a terminal and a bunch of commands, you can even listen to Spotify. It's so great. Of course, I'm joking. But the point is that complete freedom also puts the brakes on mass adoption of new tech. Because people want something that is easy enough to work and understand. This is why people buy Apple products and get sucked into the ecosystem. Because stuff just works. There are no viruses. You can try that everything is just going to be working. But does the iPhone really need this hyper-control regime to make this happen? Well, no. And the proof comes from Apple themselves, because they are the ones that built the Mac. You still have your App Store and you can download stuff from there, but you can just download anything from the internet. And you're not worried that it's going to catch in flames or break down. And yes, if I want, I can even mess with the terminal and do all kinds of weird stuff. And this is the reason why after switching to Mac from a lifetime of Windows, I love it, but I'm still a diehard Android user. And the Vision Pro that just came out is probably even more locked up than the iPhone. You need an iPhone to even use it to scan your face. It only connects to a Mac to use your screen in VR. And the few actual native apps that you can use are already showing what's the intention with this device. You want to take a screenshot while you're watching a movie on Disney Plus? Well, Disney is going to obscure the movie because, well, you know, Disney. Because as with many things in life, the truth is in the middle. It's balancing the right amount of freedom and the right amount of ease of use and a bit of wall gardening. This is where things are easy enough to use that they can be adopted by the mainstream, but they're also open enough that anyone can come in and build something new and cool on top of it. And this is what creates the positive cycle that makes everyone win. And the most powerful example of what happens when you merge freedom with the right level of world gardening is the modern web. I know some people are nostalgic of the good old days, but in my book, the modern web is just amazing. 10 years ago, you could read articles, watch some videos online, and that's it. But today, you can use Figma to design in multiplayer on gigantic files in real time. You can edit videos online. You can collaborate on any document. You can design 3D models online, and you can do it from any device and any browser. Today, web apps are very close, if not as good as native apps in many cases. And thanks to progressive web apps, you can even add them to your home screen and use them in full screen, just like you would do with normal ones. And there's total freedom to build whatever you like on the web. But there's also protections and make things safe and easy to use. Apps cannot just take any data they want. They need to ask permission for location or accessing the camera, and they cannot just install random shit on your computer. Okay, so all of this is cool, but why is this important? Apple is making their money. Some developers and big companies are complaining. 
whatever. Well, not really. Because this very thing, this war for apps, is what can make or break the next generation of technology. So the Apple Vision Pro just came out. Everyone is excited, it's getting absurd amounts of hype, but something peculiar has happened. Many big companies that have fought with Apple in the last years because of the Apple tax are finally taking revenge. And they didn't even bother to make an app for the Vision Pro. There's no YouTube app, there's no Spotify app, there's no Netflix app. These are all multi-billion dollar companies. They definitely have the resources for this. And the Vision Pro has been getting massive media attention even before the release. But instead they went, meh. So the only way to access these services is through the web. And by the way, the Vision Pro doesn't even support progressive web apps, so you cannot pin websites on your home screen. And I know, most of us are not here with a big pile of cash in our hands trying to buy a Vision Pro. This is not the device that's gonna change the world, and Apple knows it really well. It was designed this way. The Vision Pro is a way for them to show us their vision of an augmented reality future, with a really niche but bulky and heavy headset that uses pass-through, because the technology for true augmented reality with transparent displays is just not here yet. And I made a whole video about it, you can, you can watch it here. And when the next AR device hits, the one that is truly designed to be mainstream, this is when that first iPhone magic has the chance to happen again. A new generation of devices that can interact with our environment, where you can share virtual experiences with other people in the room, not just playing alone on your couch, an explosion of people building all sorts of cool things that improve our lives and... or... or... or not. Today, Apple has lost the trust of many developers, large and small, who see it as an evil overlord that just wants to get rich. And I mean, they're a company, they want to make money, and today they have the power to do it. But by milking the App Store cow, they are threatening their future, because when the moment comes for the next iPhone-like product to come out, developers big and small would think twice before committing to building on their platform again. And no, I'm not exaggerating, because this exact situation already happened. And what came out of it is the internet as we know it today. At the end of the 1990s, Microsoft was in the same spot Apple is in today. Windows 95 was a huge success, and more than 90% of devices connected to the internet, which at the time were basically only computers, were using Windows. And the internet was the hot new thing. But Microsoft basically forced you to use their own browser, Internet Explorer, instead of competitors like Netscape. It's not like you could not use other browsers, but they made it extremely hard to use anything else other than Internet Explorer. And just imagining to only be able to use Internet Explorer brings me nightmares. And this led to one of the most famous antitrust cases in tech, where Microsoft was sued for anti-competitive behavior, and they lost. And in doing that, they opened the door for the modern internet. Google, Amazon, and anything that came out of the internet revolution of the 90s is here also because Microsoft gave up their tight grip on the web. In an alternative universe, instead of ChatGPT, people are using this. And in trying to milk the internet cow, Microsoft eventually lost. A ton of developers build a negative perception of the company. And when the opportunity came, they just migrated away to other platforms and started building on the web, which is now much more open and growing. But when in that courtroom, the judge asked Bill Gates, how did he learn the things that got him to build such a huge empire? He only had one thing to say. Your Honor, Skillshare. Now, okay, this probably went a little differently, but hear me out. I love the internet because it's literally the first time in history that anyone can learn anything from anywhere. And to be frank, you can find online basically anything for free. But the big problem is that it takes an enormous amount of time and energy because you don't have any guidance and you'll soon end up feeling overwhelmed. And this is the value of Skillshare. It's not only about what you learn, but the fact that you can get guidance in learning a specific topic. I learned video editing back in 2010, and it was so hard to navigate in a sea of random tutorials on YouTube. But if you want to do it today, it's much easier because Skillshare now has learning paths, collections of hand-picked classes in photography, graphic design, music, and much more, in a range of experience levels from beginner to advanced. For example, believe it or not, the guitar that you see here is real. It's not a prop. And this year, I really want to level up my playing, which I need if I want to play my favorite John Mayer songs. And for this, I'm taking the level up your guitar playing learning path. So thank you Skillshare for making these videos possible and the first 500 people to use... Yep, don't mind the guitar. As I was saying, the first 500 people that use the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. And now back to the video, because Apple now is at a crossroads. There's two roads they can take. First is that they take their nice little Apple ecosystem walled garden, they pull a Donald Trump and they build an even higher wall around the garden. I would love Google to resurrect the Google Glass project, but being realistic, Apple today is the best position to build the first truly mainstream 
true augmented reality product. They have already made acquisition of VR companies and leaks have confirmed that they've been working on it. But if they decide to build it in their little walled garden way, this would almost surely end up being an iPhone accessory and likely to be even more locked down than the Vision Pro, which is already telling you you're a bad person for trying to take a screenshot of a Disney movie. Sure, the device would work great with all your Apple stuff you already have, but this is Apple basically saying, we make the best stuff and we don't need anyone else. We don't need Netflix, we don't need Spotify, just use your Apple stuff and look, there's Disney, there's Mickey Mouse, it's cool, it's driving a boat. Oh, uh, never mind, that, that's public domain now. This is the innovator's dilemma. A large company that's already successful is not really incentivized to break what's working and come up with something new. But funnily enough, it's what they need if they want to stay the big successful company in the long run. And this brings us to the second scenario, which I think would be the smartest move for Apple, which is to build an AR device that, yes, has all their neat ecosystem apps, but that doesn't require an iPhone to necessarily work. Remember, the iPod got its big break only when iTunes for Windows was released, allowing everyone to use an iPod even with a Windows computer. And that iPod was probably the first Apple device for many people. And the second thing they could do to get developers and third-party companies back on their side is to really leverage the web and augmented reality together. Sure, they can have their app store, but they create also ways to make augmented reality application using the web, which now supports very complex stuff. Apple has this thing called ARKit, which allows anyone to build AR experiences on iOS. But there are already web frameworks to build in augmented reality, like WebXR. If Apple embraces them or builds their own open one with all the safety and seamlessness, it can merge the openness of the web and true augmented reality. And this will make them even more money than being the evil overlord and kickstart another crazy wild ride in consumer tech recreating that magic moment that happened with the iPhone. But imagine if Apple never existed and all of these tech companies, instead of being in Silicon Valley, were in Italy? Well, that almost happened. And in this video, you can learn about the untold story of how Italy almost became Silicon Valley.